This week on What the Hell Canada. A bunch of people freak out about a tax they're not going to pay. Saskatchewan's government descends even deeper into chaos. The Saskatchewan government makes teachers their final offer. Spoiler alert, it's not going to be their final offer. Edmonton's neonative intensive care unit is experiencing a capacity crisis and the Alberta government is pretending that nothing's happening. The Trudeau government rolls out halal mortgages to the horror of the right-wing reactosphere, who don't realize that they've been around for years. And we talk about what's holding Canada back as a nation. It's jerks! All this and more as we ask the big question on everyone's mind, what the hell, Canada? The federal budget came out this week and people are predictably freaking out. There's a lot of different stuff in it and a lot of it we've already talked about, but right now what I want to highlight is the increase to the capital gains tax, because a bunch of folks are freaking the hell out about this. So let's talk about what's happening and how it's going to affect you, and more specifically, how it likely won't. For starters, unless you're watching this from a diamond encrusted sofa, the odds that this is going to affect you personally are low. So the main change in this year's budget of the tax system is going to be a change to the exemptions for capital gains. They're changing the inclusion rate from 50% of gains above $250,000 to 66% of gains above $250,000. Now that's not what you're paying, that's how much of it is taxed. There's also a once in a lifetime $1.25 million capital exemption. And in 2025, they're also adding another partial exemption up to $2.25 million. This means they're gonna pay about six cents on the dollar more on capital gains above a quarter million dollars. Oh no, whatever shall they do? And to be clear, over a 10 year period, 80% of taxpayers never generate any capital gains ever. And of the 20% who do, the average amount is $5,200. The impact of this is extremely narrow. So unless you're watching this from a diamond encrusted lazy boy or from the deck of your mega yacht, you're probably going to be fine. And frankly, this is perfectly reasonable. 100% of your labor is taxed, but only a portion of capital gains are. Why does that make any sense other than to disproportionately benefit those who have access to capital? And as you can see from this chart, the actual marginal tax rate on capital gains is still going to be relatively low. And we've been slashing corporate taxes and capital gains taxes for years. The effective tax rates on large corporations are still at some of their lowest points in Canadian history as are our capital gains rates. And anybody who tells you that it's gonna cause people with money to flee Canada or take their business elsewhere is just making that up. There's no evidence to support that. And the idea that somebody would uproot a profitable business in order to avoid a small increase on capital gains rates is ridiculous. Like why would an existing corporation that's making a quarter million dollars of capital gains a year just leave? We need to stop treating capital like some sort of volcano god that we need to be constantly making sacrifices to in order to appease it. Capital is nothing without the workers. You can buy all the stuff you like, but without workers to run it, you don't have much. But capitalists only seem to care about themselves and their money. That sweet, sweet money. It's a pretty clear reminder that the capitalists aren't loyal to countries. They're only loyal to capital. They don't care about the society that they benefit from. They just care about money. And so, yeah. Now you're seeing a bunch of people freaking out about the potential loss in value in selling their investment properties or their businesses. But in reality, this is only going to affect about 0.13% of Canadians. That winds up being about 40,000 people across Canada. And their average gross income, including capital gains, is $1.41 million. I think they're going to be okay. And as far as corporate capital gains go, again, it's a very small portion of very profitable companies. It winds up only affecting the capital gains of about 12.6% of all corporations in Canada. And before you freak out about losing the value of your primary residence, it's specifically exempted from this. Capital gains do not affect your primary residence. And if you are hearing people complain that it's forcing them to sell investment properties, good, there's a housing crisis. We need more housing stock. You don't need to. People who are holding multiple houses are a part of the housing crisis. Oh no, won't someone please think of the landlords? I actually don't, they're gonna be fine. In most countries, capital gains are just taxed at the normal rate without exemptions. So once again, it's a case where Canada's system is disproportionately benefiting those who already have lots of money. So anyone who suggests that this is killing jobs is being ridiculous. Capital gains are only realized when a business is sold. So who's going to change their behavior while running their business in order to specifically avoid capital gains when selling their business by keeping employment numbers down? That doesn't make any sense. And that top 0.13% that are hoarding all of Canada's wealth and complaining about the capital gains tax rates that they're going to have to pay? I just want to illustrate here that those families control about 20% of Canada's total wealth. So when you see wildly inaccurate analysis saying things like middle-class Canadians are going to get hit by this, 
They aren't. I don't know a lot of middle class Canadians who are realizing a quarter million dollars of capital gains annually. Anybody who is doing that and still thinks they are middle class is out to lunch. And you know that this is likely a good idea because you hear a lot of criticism about it from people with phenomenal sums of money, like Bill Morno. Shocking that one of Canada's richest people came out against a budget with capital gains tax increases. And an open letter signed by 150 tech CEOs and leaders complaining about the capital gains increases. They claimed that it would cause significant harm to Canada, neglecting the fact that they've caused significant harm to Canada. They can only look in one direction. The wealthy hold an incredible sum of money, and the rest of us are just feeding off of scraps. And while this increased capital gain is a positive, it's only a small step in the right direction. The wealthy have lived large in this country for years, while hollowing it out from the inside. They're not creating anything, they're not adding anything, they're just rent-seeking. And now, they hope to be able to walk away without contributing to the society that they've so benefited from. And I, for one, am not okay with that. My main concern with this capital gains tax increase is that the inclusion rate should increase to 100%. Capital gains should be taxed at the same rate as labor, if not higher. Workers work harder than money does. It's that simple. We need to build a country for the people, not for capital. And taxing capital gains more is a very small step in the right direction. But at least it's a start. This week was a wild one in the Saskatchewan legislature, so let's talk about it. As this week, instead of SAS party corruption, I'm bringing you a different special segment. SAS party dysfunction. Ba -ba -ba -da. Ba -ba -ba -da. Ba -da. You see, the Saskatchewan government is hopelessly inept. They are destroying the province in basically every way they can think of. And all they really have is a tax and distraction. But there's another layer here. It's not just that they take and keep power, it's that they feel entitled to it. They feel entitled to their positions, entitled to their impunity, and entitled to their arrogance. And I think that was really on display last week when Jeremy Harrison was asked by the Speaker of the House to withdraw and apologize for referring to somebody as lying, which is considered unparliamentary. I'll let the clip speak for itself. I would ask the Minister of Trade and Export Development uh, for the use of the word lie. You know very well you can't do indirectly what you're not allowed to directly. Please uh, stand up and withdraw and apologize. Uh, withdraw and apologize. Stand up, please. Don't slouch <gasps> with disrespect of the institution. Stand up. Withdraw and apologize. Recognize the member. The facial expression on Harrison's face is perhaps the funniest thing I've ever seen. He looks astonished that someone would have the gall to tell him what to do. He looks like a kid whose babysitter told him he couldn't have ice cream for breakfast. So the speaker who admonished him here is a guy named Randy Weeks. And before you get too excited about what a great speaker Randy is, he's been doing this for a while now, and he's largely let the Saskatchewan legislature devolve into a mess. It's basically been an endless barrage of nonsense and crosstalk, nobody follows the rules, nobody answers questions, and it's been disgraceful. But recently, Randy's decided to turn up the heat on the Sask party. And if you're wondering why, the answer is pretty obvious. He's got nothing to lose. He's been the speaker for four years now, but this year will be his last, as he lost a contested nomination in his riding. So he had been previously running in a pretty safe riding. And then when riding boundaries were redrawn, he went to what he believed was the most winnable riding and lost. So he's deciding to try to leave himself with at least a few shreds of dignity on his way out the door by trying to reinstate a bit of order in the house. But you see, his attempt to reinstate order didn't just stop there. And neither did him humiliating Jeremy Harrison. And Jeremy Harrison absolutely deserves it. He is the single most poorly behaved member of the Saskatchewan legislature. And that's really saying something. He's the House leader, and he's constantly heckling, constantly yelling, and the last time that I was in the House, the entire time that opposition leader Carla Beck was trying to speak, he would just yell, Carla who, Carla who, the entire time. It's not even that he's just a terrible corrupt politician, he's also a jerk. He's constantly heckling and insulting, and never answers questions, he just attacks. But that won't stop him from going on very expensive trips. He loves doing that on the taxpayer dollar. Big fan of living large on our dime. But he'll cut all the funding for everything else. It's his way. The other character that I'm going to show you in this clip is Finance Minister and Deputy Premier Donna Harpower. You see, she's been quite bothered that the Saskatchewan NDP have been pushing in the House for answers about incredibly corrupt dealings with MLA Gary Graywall. His hotels received almost $800,000 of taxpayer funds, and the party doesn't really like answering questions about that. So in order to try to put a stop to that, Donna Harpower decided to text the Speaker of the House during the legislative session, and Randy Weeks took offense to it. Just look at this clip. He's furious. His hands are shaking as he reads. It has moved to adjourn debate. It is a pleasure, Assembly, to adopt the motion. Just while I'm on my feet, I have, as Speaker, I have received literally hundreds and hundreds 
of text messages from the the government house leader, the deputy government house leader, and occasionally from the Minister of Finance. Uh, I'd just like to read into the record what the Minister of Finance just sent me. Randy, if you can blatantly lie, tarnish reputations of elected and unelected individuals with innuendos but no proof, we have no avenue to push back, then this assembly has become a joke and a stage for an opposition puppet show. Disappointing. First of all, uh, if you want to make a point of order, get on your feet. And uh, I ask the Minister of Finance to withdraw and apologize for this text and any others that you may feel inclined to send me off the record. I withdraw and apologize. Go ahead, Kathy. But you see, that's not the end of the story here. Randy wanted to move forward with the proceedings, but do you know who didn't? Jeremy Harris, who could not stop heckling. He appears to have been heckling the speaker, which I don't know how to tell you this, Jeremy Bear, but you're really not supposed to do that. Now, we don't know specifically what Harrison said, but clearly Randy Weeks was not impressed. Just watch this clip. Patent Box Amendment Act 2020. I ask the Mr. government House to stand and withdraw and apologize for that comment, too. I'm not deaf. I'm not. Mr. Jeremy Harrison, I hereby name you for disregarding the authority of the chair. Pursuant to Rule 57-2, the member is suspended from the service of the assembly for the remainder of the sitting day. Okay, Kathy. Spicy. Harrison was kicked out for the rest of the day, and then the government just sort of pretended that nothing happened. But after the fact, Randy Weeks shared that he's received hundreds of texts from the SAS party government. And I just want to point out, the precedent's been set here. Randy should probably read those into the record. I'm sure they're going to be fascinating reading. And Scott Mo weighed in in his typical gutless way, saying that the MLAs, quote, text the speaker at their own peril. He took no actual stance at all. He didn't even go as far as to say that the members shouldn't have done it. There was literally no consequence. They're just angry that the NDP is allowed to ask questions about their obvious corruption. They're taking offense to the fact that they're being held accountable. They're just taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from the public coffers, and when you have the audacity to ask them about it, they just clutch their pearls in desperate offense. But because Scott Moe has absolutely no courage at all, all he has to say is, well, I won't speak on behalf of what's appropriate and not appropriate for those two to be communicating. Honestly, it's just pathetic stuff. But this is indicative of a larger problem in Canadian politics and parliamentary politics in general. They get completely hung up on theatrics and we wind up with, they get completely hung up on theatrics and we wind up with houses that just yell at one another. I don't even take my classes to the legislature anymore because it's become embarrassing. Members sit on their phones, read at their desks, ignore the proceedings, yell at one another, slam their desks, a bunch of behavior we wouldn't put up with in a grade school classroom, so why do we put up with it from elected officials? But even more than that, how are people not appalled at this? Imagine if you found out that Krista Freeland was sending text messages to Speaker Fergus in the house in the middle of proceedings telling him what to do. Who would be okay with that? Who would say that that was appropriate? The Saskatchewan government is arrogant and they believe themselves to be above the rules and it shows every day. They gotta go. Saskatchewan teachers have received a final offer from the Saskatchewan government, and we're going to vote on it early next month. And it is bad. For a bunch of reasons. Let's talk about it. So, quick bargaining recap. I've talked about it a bunch, so we're just going to kind of zip through it. I'll link some longer breakdowns below. Bargaining started in May. Teachers were offered raises of 3, 2, and 2% 2 over three years and basically nothing else. Saskatchewan government bargained in bad faith pretty much the entire time and things have been ugly. There have been a bunch of strikes, worked rules, other stuff, but the, contra but the actual contract offer from the government hasn't changed. Even though the government said they were going to offer what they give to MLAs, which is 4% this year and cost of living each of the next three years, that appears to be off the table since the new offer is significantly worse than that. Interesting, that. Almost like they're liars. So the latest offer is a final offer. And as such, the teacher is going to vote on it. Now, it's really important to note here, the government's trying to frame this as a tentative agreement. It isn't. And the head of the government trustee bargaining committee, Don Hoyam, came out and said, we have a tentative agreement. Which again, no you don't. Because here's the thing about tentative agreements. If one side says there's an agreement, and one side says there isn't, there isn't an agreement. The government's just been completely intransigent in negotiations and has said, this is the only offer you're going to get, so you best go vote on it. So I guess that's where we're at. The first part of the offer is on wages. It is three, three, and two over three years. 
which is not only significantly less than what teachers are asking for, it's also less than the last offer they made via Twitter. Turns out that the actual offers are super different from the ones they make on Twitter videos. Funny that. Now, teachers are asking for a cost of living each year plus 2% each year over the next four years. We've lost a lot of buying power over the last couple of years, and our wages have lagged significantly behind other sectors in Saskatchewan's economy. Since 2017, teacher wages have increased by 7%. Compare that to the rest of the Saskatchewan economy that grew by 19% over the same time. And over these last two agreements, where we got 7%, inflation's been 15.5%. We've lost 8.5% of our purchasing power since 2017. We're just trying to get some of that back, and I don't think that's unreasonable. But wages aren't all that we're fighting for here. We're also trying to deal with class size and complexity. There are a huge problem in Saskatchewan schools. Violence against teachers... There are huge problems in Saskatchewan schools. There's violence against teachers, overfilled classrooms, teachers taking stress leaves, teacher shortages, and more. And the government simply refuses to do any and the government simply refuses to do anything to deal with this. Teachers have been trying since day one to get contractual guarantees to address class size and complexity. The government brought forward a funding framework that gave a 9% funding increase this year and an accountability framework to make sure that they spend that money. But that's it. It's just a one-time funding increase. And that 9% is only enough to prevent most divisions from needing to make cuts. That's about it. It's not even going to get close to addressing the serious issues that we face. Over the last decade, Saskatchewan has fallen from the top of per-student-funded schools in the country to the worst. Our schools are crumbling, supports have been cut at every turn, and students are the ones who pay the price. Teachers are burned out, stressed, and begging for support, and all the government has to say is no. So after strikes, work to rules, and more, the government has increased its contract offer by 1% off of the initial offer they brought on day one. And they have added one sentence. The parties agree that the MOU on the accountability framework will be followed and honored. That's it. But I think it's also worth noting that the accountability framework and funding models are insufficient. They increased funding this year by $360 million, yes. But all that happens after that is that that funding stays put. That's it. It's effectively a three-year funding freeze. It's going to solve nothing. So teachers, if I haven't made myself abundantly clear here, vote no. This is a bad deal. Bad deal. Bad. No. The government's trying to make the union's position look weak by creating the illusion of a divided membership. Do you really believe that all of the fighting that we've done is worth 1% more? Because I haven't talked to a single teacher who's satisfied with it. And frankly, if you're anything like me, you feel insulted. But you know who really feels insulted? This woman. Her name is Taya Thomas. She was invited to the Saskatchewan legislature to share her story. Her daughter, Mayel, had a number of medical conditions. She experienced a lot of difficulty in her education and she wasn't able to go to high school because there was no room for her in a specialized program. And she had a condition that made her unable to sweat, so she would overheat very easily. And if she overheated, she would have severe seizures. Her classroom could get above 30 degrees Celsius. It wasn't the funding or ability to add air conditioning to the school or to provide an air-conditioned space for Mayel. Now, sadly, for reasons separate from schooling, Mayel passed away at 13 years old. And when Mayel's mother, Taya, came to the legislature to tell her story, Jeremy Cockrell insulted her. He said something truly astonishing. When he was speaking about the STF contract negotiations, he said directly to a grieving mother, quote, What do they want me to do? Give up my firstborn child? Now, he claims that he apologized at the time, but Taya says that he did not. Just watch this clip. I asked you about Miss Thomas. I met with her earlier this week and, quote, you told her, What do they want me to do? Give up my firstborn child? Why did you tell her that? It was a really poor choice of words on my part. And uh, I apologize for that. And, and uh, I'm human. And when did you apologize to her? I apologized in the meeting with her that I had the other day. Because he says he apologized to you, yes, or sorry, when you were here to you. Um, you were saying that didn't happen. It did not happen. So what do you think about that? Exactly as I said, it makes me wonder what kind of person is in charge of our children's education, ultimately their future, if he can't even sympathize with just one parent. I mean, I'm he not only once did he insult me, he did it in the chamber, he did it again in private, and again today he again said parents need to be more engaged. I promise you, any medical mama like me, we are fully engaged. I asked the teacher, because I reflected on myself, I wondered, did I do enough? So I asked the teacher and she said, Taya, I promise you, you've been doing enough since she's been here. And I'm still here trying to do more. So excuse me if I take it a little personal. I'm inclined to believe her if I'm honest. Let's see if Jeremy has the courage to call her a liar. Also, 
He said, quote, I'm human. I made a mistake. No, Jeremy. I think you very clearly illustrated that you are inhuman because that's the only kind of person who would say such a thing in that situation and the only kind of person who would not apologize immediately and then lie about it. So I'm going to be voting no, not only because I'm insulted by the contract, but because I'm insulted by the presence of Jeremy Cockrell as education minister. He needs to resign or be fired. This man has done nothing but piss off every teacher in the province, the public, and literally everybody. He has botched the portfolio perhaps more than any education minister we've ever had. And that's really saying something. And I can't speak for other Saskatchewan teachers, but I know for myself, my will to fight was flagging just a little bit. Honestly, if the contract was any good, I probably would have taken it. But that's not what happened. Jeremy Cockrell has decided to poke the bear. He is pissing off every teacher in the province simultaneously. He has put the fighting spirit back in all of us right before year end. It looks like he's willing to risk year end grades, grads, sporting events, and more entirely because he can't be bothered to give teachers a decent contract offer. He can't even be bothered to speak to parents with basic humanity. So I'll tell you, I'm very eager to vote no on the contract. I'm going to consider it a personal message to Jeremy Cockrell, and I hope other teachers in this province will join me. This week, we're going to expand favorite political photos because I'm running out of ideas for favorite political photos. So we're going to expand it to favorite political moments. Cast a little bit wider net. Check out the new graphic. So yeah. This week's favorite political moment is one that I absolutely die laughing every time I think of it. It is last summer when Doug Ford was giving a very ordinary speech when a live bee flew into his mouth and he ate it. It was, for lack of a better word, art. It also signaled the opening salvo in the great bee wars of 2023. Just watch this clip. From the, not coming from the uh, government per se, but the premier, it's coming from the health sector. <laughs> Holy Christ, what was that? I just swallowed a bee. Oh my Holy God. Christ, I knew that little bugger. Oh. I'm good, he's down here buzzing around right now. He has a lot of, he has a lot of real estate. Now, if that was in the clip, okay, this is gonna be replayed over and over again. Holy Christ, he's, he's wedged in my throat. Sorry guys, a little bugger got away in there. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm okay, he's buzzing in there. Man, he went right down the hatch. Okay guys. <laughs> this is a classic, okay? <laughs> this is, holy crap. I love how long you can see it lurk around his mouth and nobody says anything. And then at the end, the cameraman zooms in on Doug's stomach to really drive the point home. There's a bee in his tummy. Side note, shortly after this, I asked my friend Craig Baird from Canadian History Eggs, like below, to make me some AI images. And this was the original exchange. Hey friend, since you're the king of AI, is there any chance I can make an image request? Someone made a comment and it would be way too funny. Absolutely. What would you like? Basically just Doug Ford gorging himself on bees, lol. Hundreds upon hundreds of bees. For sure, I will send something over. You're a legend. Which is true. And it led to these masterpieces, which I love. I especially love how maniacal he looks in this one. Honestly, the general delight is amazing. But that led to a follow-up request of Doug Ford as a bee, which got us these. I love this one. It is Although, this one with the floral bee boa is amazing. So there you go. New segment. And it's about Doug Ford harfing down bees. I like to keep it surreal. The Alberta government continues to be unimaginably bad at their jobs, and they've reached an altogether new low. You see, they've been severely underfunding and undersupporting the healthcare system for years now, and the consequences of that are becoming more and more dire. They were contacted by the Edmonton Zone Medical Employees Association in 2022 and 2023, warning of potential capacity issues with their neonatal intensive care units. And now the Edmonton Zone Medical Association is also warning that the overwhelm is so bad that children's lives may be at risk. They've warned that they're in a state of crisis. They say that babies have nowhere to be cared for and they believe the situation is so dire that, quote, deaths of infants may soon follow. So to give you a sense of how things should be running, the normal expected safe capacity for an NICU is about 80 to 85%. They were running between 95 and 102% for most of the first three months of 2024. And the nurses are incredibly overwhelmed. They're typically meant to be caring for one to two babies at a given time, but most are caring for three to four high-risk babies at present. 
And as a result, the care is suffering and underweight babies aren't being fed on time. This is horrifying. Alberta is Canada's wealthiest province, and they're not even willing to pay for the care for the most vulnerable. And Adrielle Lagrange, the health minister, has made it very clear that she's going to do absolutely nothing. Although she does say that she's willing to airlift sick babies to Calgary or other provinces if need be, which is not a solution. Does she genuinely believe that you can transport underweight premature infants long distances safely? Province to province transfer is not a simple thing, and for an underweight infant requiring NICU care, it's not always a solution. And beyond that, even for those who would be safe to transport, it would be incredibly expensive to do so. Alberta had a plan to expand healthcare in Edmonton, including building another hospital, but those plans have been scrapped. But even for those who are getting care, there aren't enough private rooms either. We knew that 20 to 30 more beds were needed in 2016. In the eight years since then, there have been no new beds at all. Now, they're going to claim that they added six new beds in the Sturgeon NICU, but because of funding shortfalls, beds were closed at other sites across Edmonton. So there's been a net increase of zero beds. That is appalling. This is a government that simply doesn't give a damn. I remind you, when Danielle Smith was elected, she promised to fix the healthcare system in 90 days. That was her plan. And now we're getting direct warnings from doctors that resources are so scarce that babies may die. It is unconscionable to me that we have enough money for things like vanity projects and arenas and billions of dollars of subsidies for oil and gas companies, but we can't afford to care for the most vulnerable people in the province. This is nothing less than a failure as a society, Alberta. How is anyone okay with this? Danielle Smith needs to be held accountable and she needs to step up and fund healthcare before people get hurt. a lot of folks in the right-wing reacto sphere who are freaking out about one of the new changes brought forward in the federal budget. Halal mortgages. And you know the freakout is entirely disingenuous because they've actually been around for quite a while. All that the budget says is that it's creating a regulatory framework for halal mortgages. That's it. Just says we're looking into them. But that isn't stopping an incredibly insecure and xenophobic freakout from the right. There are a lot of folks in my comments and online claiming that this is the thin end of the wedge for Sharia law in Canada, and that's simply not the case. For starters, halal mortgages have already been offered in BC, Alberta, and Ontario, and nobody seemed to notice or care. In fact, Danielle Smith's already given this her stamp of approval, and a lot of the insincere freakout has been based on misunderstanding. Which brings me to a really important point. In the immortal words of Ted Lasso, I think it's really important to be curious, not judgmental. Because I'll be honest, when I first heard about halal mortgages, I didn't really know what they were. So I looked into it, and honestly, they're really interesting. So let's take a minute to talk about what halal mortgages are, how they work, and how they make mortgages more accessible and make Canada a more inclusive society. It's going to make home ownership accessible to a lot more people. Now, don't take that as an endorsement of the existing credit system. This is just an improvement. So for a little background here, there's a couple of things we need to understand. In Islam, there's a series of rules that cover a bunch of different practices called halal. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert here, but one thing that's included in that list is interest. Islam forbids both paying and receiving interest. So as a result, for folks who want to adhere strictly to that rule, homeownership became very difficult to access because traditional mortgages have interest. So as a solution, three different mortgage types have been developed. Ijara, where the bank buys the home and then leases it back to the owner in something that's a lot like a rent to own. Then there's Musharaka, where the bank is the joint owner of the house along with the purchaser, and the more payments the purchaser makes, the more equity they own in the house. The third option is called Murabaha, and that's essentially just a mortgage without interest, where instead, all the fees and profits are just added onto the initial price and it's paid off in installments. Interest isn't added, but an equivalent cost is. So across all these different formats, the costs wind up being the equivalent to about an 8% annual interest over the life of the mortgage. So these aren't exactly sweetheart deals. The only real reason to go for one of these arrangements is in order to keep halal. So when you see folks complaining about halal mortgages and somehow suggesting that it's special treatment for Muslims, it's pretty important to remember, these are not restricted to practicing Muslims. Anybody who wants a halal mortgage can get one. So if they genuinely think it's a sweetheart deal, there's literally nothing stopping them from signing up for one. If they want to pay 8%, knock yourself out. They're just going to be more easily and widely accessible, and now they're going to be better regulated. I think this is a rare example of good policy from the Canadian government. It's going to make homeownership more accessible to a lot of folks, and it's actually serving to open up the free market, because at present there wasn't really a regulatory space for these. This is in no way changing Canadian laws to reflect Sharia law or any other sort of Islamic principles. All it's doing is creating a regulatory space where people can live their lives according to their values and principles. I thought that's what all these freedom folks wanted, because this makes it a lot easier for people to practice their religions in a way that doesn't impact anyone but themselves. And I, for one, think that's a good thing. And now, for this week's rant.
As a country, Canada faces a lot of problems, but as a society, we're not going to be able to address any of them until we address one of the fundamental underlying issues, the loss of empathy. So many people out there have lost the ability to give a damn about anybody other than themselves. And it seems like over the last couple of years, something's changed. People's brains are really broken. I know this is a subjective experience on my part, but I feel like you see it out in public. People are less considerate, less respectful of others, and more confrontational. You see it when you go to restaurants or stores and see signs up that they won't tolerate abuse of the staff. Those signs only get put there because somebody did something that made it necessary. Crime rates are increasing, rates of violence are increasing, rates of things like random attacks are increasing. And I don't want to fearmonger about things like this. Random attacks are still quite rare, but the fact that they're increasing is a problem. And I think a lot of it really boils down to the underlying loss of empathy. A lot of people's social circles collapsed during COVID. They lost contact with friends. In a lot of cases, people with more radical views got separated from friends and family completely. A lot of folks isolated themselves from their loved ones by taking on really extreme views during COVID. And it really accelerated the descent into conspiracy theory for a lot of folks. And what it's led to is a pretty significant portion of society that just does not care about others. At all. It is about me and me alone. I got what's mine and everyone else can screw off. They want private health care only for themselves. They want private education only for their kids. Good paying jobs, but only for themselves. They want all the benefits of Canadian society, but exclusively for themselves and their direct circle. There's been a huge degradation of our sense of collective responsibility. We only care about other people as much as they can offer us. Canadian society really only seems to value people as much as they can work. If you can't work, Canada doesn't really care about you. We made that abundantly clear with the changes that we made to the Canada Disability Benefit. The government heralded it as some sort of transformative thing that would change the lives of people living with disabilities. In reality, it's 200 bucks a month. And in order to qualify, it's based off of household income, not individual income. So if you live with a partner who makes basically any income at all, you don't get support. It's unnecessarily restrictive and completely insufficient, but most folks just don't care because they don't feel like it personally affects them. And that's the problem. When you have a society that stops looking out for one another and starts only looking out for number one, then everybody loses. People seem to have lost sight of the fact that we live in an interconnected network. One person's well-being affects everyone's well-being. There's a ripple effect of the way that we take care of people. Let's look at a simple example that was highlighted recently in Ontario. People were given a guaranteed basic income as part of a pilot program. They received around $20,000 as a basic income. And as a result, people were able to access more stable housing, eat healthier, their landlords got paid on time, they went back to school, and they reported better well-being in basically every way. They were adding value to society. They were reducing the demands that they place on the system, and they were passing that on. Their children were also thriving. Nobody was just sitting on the couch and watching TV. They felt more successful at work, and everybody benefited. So, of course, you know what Doug Ford did. He cut the program, and as a result, he's being sued by the families he cut off from the program. And he spent over $300,000 on legal fees fighting them. Because that's where we're at. We'd rather spend stacks of money to avoid supporting people than just support them. We have mountains of evidence that shows that simply giving people unconditional help leads them to be far more successful by basically every measure. By either giving them direct supports or cash supports, it improves access to housing, healthcare, workforce participation, and it reduces crime and addiction rates and more. But we're not doing it. You know why? Because in Canadian society, poverty isn't viewed as a condition. It's viewed as a punishment. The only reason you could possibly be experiencing poverty is because you deserve it, clearly. You must not have worked hard enough. You must not have followed the rules. You must not have made the right decisions. Because if they can't blame you for your own poverty, then they would have to acknowledge the inequalities between you. It has to be your own fault. It couldn't possibly be systemic factors holding you down, preventing you from succeeding. It has to be on you. And because it's on you, you must be punished. And that's why supports for people in need get cut. Because there are a lot of folks out there who seem to believe the folks who are in need simply deserve to be there. It's simply not the case, and there's so much evidence that supports this. Just look at this story that's been bouncing around on Twitter the last few days. It's the story of Mike Black. He walked away from a successful business in order to undertake an experiment. He put himself to what he considered rock bottom, living without housing or money. He slept on benches, lived in a park, and more. Of course, he kept his fully paid cell phone, so he already gave himself an advantage, because he insisted that with all of his existing knowledge, he could claw his way back to success. And he managed to work his way up to living in an RV for free while flipping free items on Craigslist for a profit. But he ran out of money, his bank went into overdraft, then he landed a small marketing contract that bought him a bit of time, and he started a dog-lover-themed coffee brand. Clearly something the market was sitting up and begging for. And then he was really off to the races. His total revenue was about $750. Nailing it. Definitely found a huge market. But then Mike faced health issues. But of course he was still seeing a doctor through this whole process. 
So it wasn't really a simulation of being in need. It was just sort of cosplay. But Mike wound up quitting the experiment because it was just too hard. A millionaire literally tried to prove that he could claw his way back from homelessness with his skills and connections and failed. He still needed medical care and he was so busy scrambling to get by that he wasn't even able to spend time with his father who had stage 4 cancer. He thinks that it was illustrating something about hustle culture when in reality it was really just illustrating how hustle culture is breaking us. Instead of trying to constantly pull ourselves ahead of others, we need to start thinking about how we can advance together. We need to remember that humanity is a collective and that we're part of a greater whole. We have a responsibility to one another. We need to hold empathy for one another. We need to take care of the vulnerable and we need to shout down those who would oppose supporting them. Because some folks in society got an awfully comfortable, loudly demanding that we hold down the vulnerable. I think we've all had enough of that. And that's our show for this week, folks. As always, thanks so much for watching. And this week, I want to leave you with something just a little bit more heartwarming than normal. As for once, a politician was nice. Let's check out this photo of Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe helping someone change a tire. I don't know if I've ever seen a photo of Danielle Smith or Scott Moe pulling over to help someone. It's not really their style. Wab Canoe's really setting himself apart as a different sort of Canadian politician. One who actually gives a damn. And it's quite refreshing. So once again, thanks for watching. And as always, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell. And if you don't already know, I have a podcast. It's called Podcast is Broken with Brittle Star and Lisa, like below. I also stream on Twitch, post all the time on TikTok, yammer my opinions on Twitter, and I occasionally send messages by a carrier pigeon. Or by that weird thing from Dune where they just like whisper things in the ear of a bat. Kind of disappointed they didn't put that in the movie. Anyways, take care of yourselves, folks. There we go. Here we go, I guess. Uh, uh... I have COVID, so if my voice sounds a little scratchy, that's why. Um, and if my pacing's a little off, it's because I'm in a neocitrin-induced haze. So, look forward to that. We're going to see how long I can hold this together. All right, let's go here. And if you're going to complain about this, I highly rec- And to anybody who takes offense to this on the basis of Christianity, I highly recommend you Google the term usury. I might leave that one in the bloopers, because it'll make some people mad.